Welcome, dear listeners. Shadi and I have a treat for you today. One of our favorite authors, New York Times columnist Ross Douthat, joined us on the podcast this week. The proximate reason for his joining us is the recent release of the paperback edition of his excellent book, The Decadent Society. It was subtitled How We Became Victims of Our Own Success when it came out in hardcover last year and has been resubtitled America Before and After the Pandemic. We started talking about what has changed in Ross's thinking between when the two editions were released, and we went from there in all different directions. We obviously went long and therefore split the episode in two. The first hour is for everyone. The second 30 minutes is for paying subscribers only. We really think you'll want to subscribe for this one if you haven't yet. Go to wisdomofcrowds.live slash subscribe and make it happen. We really hope you enjoy this. Thanks for listening. There's 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 two there's two trends actually happening here. One is the the Catholics trying to convert Shadi, and then the other one is Shadi trying to convert me to Islam. Those are the two. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I saw you guy didn't listen to the whole Sorab thing, but I saw you got him to speak favorably of Islam. So yes. So that's I guess part of your pitch to Demir, and <laughs> and yes. even as you're being pitched. No, we we even got Sorab to talk about Sharia uh, and um... <laughs> Islamic Sharia, not Catholic Sharia. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, so Ross, I mean, um, well, we're very happy to have you. Um, uh, you guys will all know Ross Dow that um, his book, which is sort of the um, the pretext for us to have this conversation, but we'll talk about a bunch of different things. The new paperback edition is out and it's updated. It's called The Decadent Society, America Before and After the Pandemic. And I think what's really interesting is that the first version of the book came out last year, right before the pandemic. And so you used kind of the last year and everything that's happened to sort of um, maybe to, to reassess some of the things that you said or... or um, and I, I'm curious, and maybe I'll just start by saying a few words about decadence, because I was rereading the first chapter this morning, and I love the way that you describe decadence, which is, um, so here, here are a couple quotes. Um, it hints at exhaustion finality, but a finality that hasn't yet arrived. So why not eat, drink, and be merry in the meantime? You talk about the sense of an ending. You quote Barzun, who says that uh, with decadence, there are no clear lines of advance. You're stuck in repetition and frustration. In decadence, you have peace, but you're exhausted, depressed, and beset by flares of nihilistic violence. Decadence is characterized by a howl against a present that wasn't what was promised, and uh, so on and so forth. I, actually, I also like the quote from G.K. Um, Chesterton where he says, there was nothing left that could conquer Rome, but there was also nothing left that could improve it. So that sort of maybe gives listeners a sense of what decadence is about. And I like in last year's version of the book, you have the hardcover. It's a really nice cover. There's a there's a fat guy. Who, um, sorry, I'm not sure if <laughs> there's a large man. <laughs> Um, who is a different, um, a differently positive. weighted, a differently weighted, <laughs> a differently man. weighted man. But it's interesting that the, the hardcover picture is he's just like eating a lot of stuff. There's a lot of merriment, hedonism, drinking, and there's a, a sense of gluttonousness or gluttony. And um, so that's kind of what decadence is partly about. Um, and you also mentioned that when people hear the word decadence, they think about chocolate strawberries. So just imagine yourself, uh, dear listeners, that you are eating a bunch of very tasty chocolate strawberries and you're in this state where you're not necessarily advancing. You're in a state of luxury and self-satisfaction. And when you're self-satisfied, you're not always able to, to innovate or to be interesting or to do better things or to become better, so on and so forth. So maybe just Ross to start, like, first of all, is that, um, tell us more about how you conceptualize decadence. And also, since there was a year between the first version and this new version, what do you think the pandemic, um, did you get anything wrong? Is there anything that you feel you have to sort of reconsider or reassess in light of the pandemic? 
Yeah, so I'm still trying to figure out whether the book was spectacularly well-timed or spectacularly ill-timed <laughs> by coming out literally like three weeks before the world shut down. And, you know, obviously from the point of view of like a book tour and, and selling books, it wasn't it wasn't ideally timed. Um, in fact, I, I probably picked up the coronavirus while flying back and forth across the country trying to sell a book about decadence. So <laughs> I'm not sure what kind of what kind of <laughs> lessons to draw to draw from that. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically, the book argues that despite sort of the sense of frenzy that has sort of, you know, that sort of fills discussions about our politics, especially during the presidency of Donald Trump, despite that actually life in the United States and Western Europe, and to some extent, East, East Asia as, as well is characterized by this kind of stagnation and drift and repetition of a society that is, you know, wealthy and technologically proficient. So the argument is, in part, that this state of affairs has been going on for a while and could continue for quite a while, right, that you can actually um, sort of stay at this kind of stay in this kind of decadence, this kind of sort of slow economic growth, slow technological progress, society gets older, people have fewer kids, we watch the same Marvel blockbusters, everyone keeps imagining that we're going back to the 1930s or the 19th century, or, you know, some sort of grand ideological debate, but really, we're just sort of staging reenactments of the West's more interesting past. Um, so I, I was arguing that that could go on for quite a while. And then, of course, you know, there's nothing decadent about a global pandemic, right? It's sort of, you know, capital H history happening all at once. Um, and so in sort of the revisions, and they aren't dramatic revisions, but they are there that I made to the paperback, I tried to reckon a little bit with whether you know, whether this was a hinge moment, right? Is the pandemic the end of decadence? Did I write the book, you know, did I write the book describing a reality just as, just as it was coming to an end? And I'm not sure what the answer is, right? I mean, I think that you could say, you could, if you look at the world early in 2021, you would say that there are certain ways in which the last year has actually sort of shaken parts of, I mean, we'll just focus on America, right? Had sort of shaken parts of America out of its sense of torpor. Um, and, and that could range from sort of non-political things, like the fact that, that suddenly you have, um, you know, upper class people moving out of these sort of, you know, gated, gated cities in which they've sort of all clustered themselves over the last two generations. And, you know, you have, you know, the idea that like the internet could actually disrupt the way people work and commute and so on has been promised for a generation and hasn't actually happened. Instead, sort of upper class life has gotten more consolidated and self-segregated. And maybe that maybe the, the coronavirus is changing that. Maybe, you know, the way we work is actually being altered. Maybe the geographic distribution of the meritocracy is being changed and we'll all be living in Boise and Tulsa. Um, instead of the Acela corridor in 10 or 15 years, right? So that would be that would be sort of a small but telling shift away from decadence. Um, or then in politics, right? So in the the main change in sort of political analysis between the hardcover and the paperback is that the hardcover didn't write a lot about the phenomenon that we call now, you know, wokeness. It wrote a little bit about it, but it didn't treat it as sort of the defining ideological development of of the current era. Um, and in the paperback, you have to acknowledge that, you know, there is actually more of a revolutionary mood of some kind in um, in liberal and left wing politics, sort of driven in part by Trump, in part by the pandemic, in part because of the changes in the Republican Party, in part because of things inherent in liberalism. Um, and it's definitely a different a different vibe, shall we say, right, than, than yeah. it was a year ago. Now, but maybe that just gets sort of reabsorbed back into the structures of power, right? If wokeness just cashes out as like endless, you know, new rules for HR trainings um, and a little more racial and ethnic diversity at Harvard University, then I think it's sort of reabsorbed into decadence. 
if it cashes out in, you know, a massive program of reparation of, you know, economic reparations, then you're talking about something more dramatic. So, you know, some of these things will just become more apparent over a five or 10 or 15 year horizon. But isn't it also fair to say that none of these are really grand ideas? I suppose, I mean, I don't think wokeness is necessarily a very robust worldview. And, you know, as you point out, we'll have to wait and see how that turns out. I mean, one thing that you talk about in the book is the looking when people are stuck in a in a sense of stagnation and repetition, there is a possibility that they might look to the heavens. I think that's um, towards God, towards the stars or both. And you talk about um, space travel and going to the moon as an example of a society that is able to look beyond itself and isn't st isn't sort of treading water where it is. Is there anything quite like that now? I mean, I guess UFOs, you know, the UFOs, man, oh, yeah. right? So, <laughs> yeah, so this is no, yeah. this is the part of my book that's you know looks looks much more prescient, right? The book ends by saying, as you said, that sort of space travel and religious revival, sort of two different ways of looking at the heavens, seem like the most plausible ways that our era ends in something more than just, you know, stagnation eventually leaving, leading to collapse. But I also mentioned the possibility that, you know, you, we don't have to think of these just strictly in terms of human capacities, right? If you are religious, then you can imagine a, a revelation, a sort of reaching down from on high that changes the history of the human race. Certainly Muslims think that happened in, you know, in the seventh century AD, Christians think it happened um, in the reign of Caesar Augustus, right? So why shouldn't it happen in the presidency of Joe Biden? Or maybe what Providence <laughs> has in mind is, you know, Star Trek First Contact. And and those those lights in the sky are the end of decadence in a way that, you know, only uh, only viewers of the X-Files had, had imagined. Um, but presumably it would only end decadence if these aliens and UFOs actually try to attack us or because that no. would force us to kind of get our act together. What, what if they try to, to shape us? I mean, exactly. They, they don't have to be. It, it, it's not about, you know, it's not the only meaning comes from a new, you know, world war with the aliens. Right, Shadi? I mean, couldn't they couldn't there be some kind of, I don't know, outside greater force giving some kind of, you know, imparting some kind of meaning to all of this? Yeah, well, that's the revelation part, yeah. that if, if they are somehow... Um... But you only think a war would do it for us? <laughs> I think I think if the aliens, you know, are sort of commensurate to us in some respect, which, you know, we can we can say is pretty unlikely, but if they are sort of Star Wars or Star Trek style aliens, sort of versions of ourselves at a more advanced level of technology... Um, then even that, even if they don't attack us, I think suffices to create just a completely new age in human affairs. If the aliens come down and say, hi, we've mastered faster than light travel, um, would you like to partner with us, you know, on the colonization of SETI Alpha Prime? Um, that's that's a, that's that's the end of decadence, I think. Um, <laughs> and I, I want to stress that I'm not I think this is, you know, still you know, a highly unlikely reading of the unexplained aerial phenomena that the Pentagon is interested in. Um, but it is there at the end of the decadent society as a possibility. And um, it's, yeah, it's it's at least marginally more likely as a possibility than it was when I finished the book. What's really funny about that, Ross, actually, uh, is, is uh, I, you know, I, I, in prepping for the interview, I, I hadn't read the book yet, and I would read a bunch of reviews and, and, you know, your excerpts from it. I sat down last night, read through all of it, and I was sort of shooting shoddy notes as I'm doing it. And I said, at some point, oh, man, we got to talk about UFOs before I'd gotten to the part where you actually talk about UFOs. So it was really funny in that sense. You really did. <laughs> it, it really is uh, um, well-timed. Let me ask you one thing that, that that's striking, um, and maybe this can get us talking about uh, something. I, I feel like the there's um it's not a necessarily a conflation, but it's 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 maybe it's how you 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 generally approach the question is by both talking about material progress, but really what's interesting to you is uh is that kind of sense of I don't know, uh emotional dullness, I mean spiritual dullness, that that kind of 
uh, lack of, of fulfillment maybe in the individual, that, that sort of sense of, of emptiness maybe that, that perhaps we all feel in this modern world. It really struck me, you know, uh, Shadi was quoting some earlier things. It's the, 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 uh, the Auden quote is that, that really uh, jumped out for me, you know, again about the Roman Empire. It says it managed to last four centuries without creativity, warmth, or hope. And it's it's that that that's most driving you, right? Not so much the technological stuff, even though obviously, I mean, they're connected somehow. But it's it's the fact that that you're worried that we're unable to do these these human things, right? As a society. Yes, although I think that you know, if if I can sort of stand out my, outside my myself and try and analyze what makes my own work distinctive, I. Th- I think it's the attempt to combine that that concern with an analysis of sort of technological change and technological slowdown or a shift from, you know, what I call technologies of exploration to technologies of simulation, which I think is sort of the key the key shift of the last 40 or 50 years and one that has in its own way changed the culture substantially. Um, so, you know, I mean, I know you guys had uh, my friend Sora Bamari on um, in in a prior podcast, right? And, you know, in certain ways, he and I belong to, you know, I mean, we belong to the same religious tradition. Um, Sora is more of a pugilist and I'm, I'm more of a sort of ironical observer. Um, but, you know, we have sort of broadly similar religious theological takes on, you know, the sort of what is what is lost um, under conditions of secularization and the decline of Christianity in the West, right? We, and but I, I, I think that like the argument in the decadent society is that there is this kind of hidden and not fully understood even by by me or at all by me relationship between spiritual exhaustion and technological shifts, technological stagnation, and so on, right? That they're a- actually the you know this narrative of sort of you know science scientific progress and secularism go together and they're pitted against sort of an enchanted world and you know a meaningful world a spiritual world a christian world that's actually mostly wrong and in fact sort of spiritual you know sort of spiritual ambition spiritual purpose can flourish under conditions of rapid technological change, industrial development, all of these things. Um, and in a weird way, in the last 50 years, we've entered into sort of spiritual and technological stagnation at the same time. And that's not a coincidence. So so yes, I am deeply concerned about the spiritual side of things. Um, I, I have to be as, as a religious person who writes about a, um, in many ways, less and less traditionally Christian society. But I think you can't understand the spiritual dimension without this sort of technological, economic, political dimension, too. I guess, you know, the the part where where that was striking to me reading it was um, that in some ways, again, it's it's in the book seems to sometimes pivot between, I think, a concern for the Western spiritual thing. But then you, you make also observations about convergence uh, about a lot of these other trends that are shaping our decadence uh, globally uh, about, you know, uh, uh, fertility, natality uh, trends uh, as progress happens. Um, and and <clears throat> I guess, how do I put it? Are you in, in that tension between, between the sort of voiding of spirituality uh, and, and technological progress and modernity, um, do you feel... <sighs> Do you feel like that 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 basically this kind of sense of ennui, uh, this kind of, I mean, it's almost a sapping of vitalism that you get in some of the passages, right, in society, uh, is going to affect non-Christian societies in the exact same way? I mean, I guess that's the the thing that 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 kept jumping out at me, and I kept querying myself and thinking about, you know, not that I know much about China. I, I I've been there, you know, as a as a as a young child, and just a couple of years ago for, uh, for the first time and as an adult don't get much of a sense of, of a society just by visiting like that. But I, I, I uh, do you get a sense of that, especially when you look at something like like the at least the kind of propaganda that's coming out of China, but also a kind of sense of of uh, 
of pride that the Chinese have in their own progress, at least superficially, yeah. a certain kind of sense of possibility there. So do you, can you can you maybe tease that out a little bit? Again, again, that sort of tension of like convergence of technologically engendered ennui and sort of, you know, the possibility that that uh, that the spiritual dimension is different because of the cultural dimension being different in different parts of the world. Yeah, I think you can see both both possibilities there in certain ways, right? So, you know, if you look at developments in non-Western civilizations generally, not just China, but, you know, I think this applies to um, to India, to the subcontinent, it, imply, it applies to um, places like Turkey. You have, especially in the last 20 years, a, you know, an, an increasing sense of sort of possibility in civilizational distinctiveness, if that kind of mouthful mm. makes sense, right? This sense that sort of, you know, that there is, there are lines of modernization available where it's not just, you know, that you're trying to become like the West, but in fact, you were trying to build a, you know, sort of Han Chinese Confucian 21st century. You are trying to build, you know, a sort of a, a Hindu based 21st century. You're trying to build, you know, a sort of restored Turkic civilization slash Islamic 21st century. And that that side of things, I think, is dangerous in the sense that it's associated with um, turns towards more authoritarian and in China's case, totalitarian modes of politics, turns towards um, religious and ethnic chauvinism. At the same time, it is anti-decadent in the sense, and, and this is, you know, one of the points I make in the book is that, you know, getting out of decadence is not a sort of morally, it's not an inevitable moral improvement <laughs> to leave decadence behind, right? You can leave decadence yeah. behind by getting into, you know, a sort of uh, a, vital, uh, a vital cruelty or something, right? Um, but yeah, but I think all of those trends are anti-decadent, right? The idea that you can sort of have a sort of, pre uh, sort of reach back to your civilization's pre-modern pre-western roots in order to forge something new to compete with and surpass the decadent west um so that's real at the same time if you just sort of look statistically right at a lot of those those regions and cultures you can see a certain kind of evidence of convergence and stagnation right like and and you know, just measured in terms of, you know, take indicators of economic growth and indicators of demographic, demographic trends, right? The demographic trend everywhere outside sub-Saharan Africa is towards convergence with the West, convergence in low fertility, convergence in aging with places in East Asia on the periphery, especially um, South Korea, Taiwan, having fertility rates below even you know, even the decadence of Western Europe, right? Um, and then you have, I think, open questions at the very least about whether um, the sort of the sort of countries and regions that were supposed to define or dominate the post-American world, to use the old Farid Zakaria line, um, are actually going to grow fast enough to to achieve even parity with with the slow growth North American Western European regions or whether they're going to hit sort of some kind of threshold of stagnation in their turn. And I think this question hangs over both China and India in different ways right now. It's not clear that China is actually going to get as rich as its East Asian neighbors, let alone the U.S., before it hits some kind of demographically driven stagnation. So that's a long way of saying if you look at, yeah, if you look at sort of read the world of rhetoric and ideas, you would say there's a lot of anti-decadence at work outside the West right now. If you look at structural factors, you'd say there's a lot of a lot of forces pushing us towards global decadence, convergence and decadence, converging and aging and and twilight, if you will. So th so this is why I'm a little bit torn, because part of me, you know, I'm similar to you, Ross, in that I'm I'm a liberal who's critical of liberalism. I don't know if you'd, you you're maybe a post. I'm not sure how you do self describe a post liberal or a questioning liberal. I I mean I I th I a think I think conservative sense. is fine. I think it's it's fine. <laughs> to, you know, we 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 get into these we get into these debates, but fundamentally, I'm I think I'm still a I'm a conservative with 
yeah, I, I'm a I'm I'm a conservative. Let's leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, to be clear to everyone, I, I'm talking, yeah, I'm talking about cl classical liberalism. I wouldn't ever want to suggest that Ross is like shifting to the left. So or I'm not a class, right. I'm definitely not a classical liberal. No, that's, that's <laughs> yes, definitely true. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of post liberal curious. Um, oh, that's but good. I, but I, like I have that, a actually. lot of, I have a lot of skepticism about the coherence of, of post liberal politics at the moment. Okay. Yeah, so I'm post-liberal curious too, Good. but also I still think... <laughs> so, but, okay, but here's, here's the reason that I'm torn. I mean, part of me... Part of me sees all the weaknesses of this decadent society, and that spiritual emptiness, I think, is, is a profound problem because ultimately it affects individual happiness and individual fulfillment. I think... I think most Americans at some fundamental level, they sense that something is wrong. Whether it could be with society more broadly in their own hearts, in their own lives on a daily basis, something doesn't, you know, we're struggling to make yep. sense of this moment. We're trying to find meaning and structure and belonging and we're groping for it because we don't know quite where to look for it. Um, so I take all of that. On the other hand, there is something vaguely satisfying about living in decadence, you know, in part because of what I mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes it is nice to not have to, to not feel a need to fight for something, to not struggle for your civilization, to not always be in a state of vibrancy, because that can be exhausting. It, it can also be authoritarian, um, as we mentioned, China, India, Turkey, and so on. There's a kind of excess of emotion that can result from anti-decadence, where I think that sometimes I have this fantasy of just like being left alone, doing my own thing, and I grope for my own meaning in whatever way I can. Sometimes I fail. I have access to different religious traditions. Um, I can become, you know, more religious as a Muslim if I want, um, and that's ultimately up to me. And, you know, maybe there is an, and there is a tension, I think, in your book where, I, at least from my standpoint, I was reading it and I'm like, well, decadence isn't so bad, is it? If we're just in this endless state of repetition and we have high standards of living and at least for the next 20 to 30 years, things probably won't get too bad. It might get bad in 100 years if we have, it will, we'll really feel the effects of declining fertility. Right. Um, and and how that affects um, the welfare state and um, and redistribution and so on. Like we probably won't feel the biggest brunt of that in the next 10 to 20 years. That's more of a 30, 40, 50 year thing. And granted, I guess we might still be alive then, but we'll be like dying or whatever. And we'll be like really old and we probably will, you know, be retiring somewhere by a beach. So do, do we really care all that much? But um, so, I mean, how do you like how how do you sort of grapple with that like um do you ever feel in your own life ross that you just you're cool with just doing your own thing and living in this decadent society and you found a way to find meaning in your own life in that you have been able to maintain your sense of spiritual and religious fulfillment um as an individual it's working pretty good for you um in that regard i, I don't know I'm, I'm reading maybe too much into your but like you know um, you haven't lost faith. Um, you found a way to make it work for yourself. Um, is that why not just continue with that? Well, I mean, so one, obviously, I have sympathies in that direction, right? Which is, I mean, I, I have a I have a chapter in the book called "Giving Decadence Its Due," which basically makes a version of the argument you've just yep. made. And you know, and there are there are writers and thinkers who explicitly or implicitly, I think, basically take that position, right? That sort of, you know, the 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 sort of decadent society, the wealthy, low birth rate society is sort of the best we can do, right, at this moment. And it has its benefits. You're, you know, you're less likely to to sort of despoil the earth if population growth slows down. You're, at, you know, you're more at peace than the the more exciting societies of the 20th century, um, and I think all that is all that is true. And you know, there's nothing like living through a pandemic to make you appreciate appreciate the sort of ordinary virtues of stability um, in in your society. 
so all that is real. At the same time, the danger of living with decadence is that you are sort of, you know, inch by inch and day by day, sort of normalizing dystopian tendencies, right? And so the dystopia that sort of hangs over our own society right now is mostly Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, right? The the, the world where sort of the most important human goods have disappeared and nobody even realizes that they need to miss them because they have perfectly calibrated drugs and virtual reality and pornographic entertainment to effectively um, to effectively take the place of, you know, religion, humane pursuits, marriage, love, family, all, all of the rest of it. Right. Um, and the nature of dystopia is that you don't actually get there. We're not actually going to get to that destination, but you can go more steps along that path. And I think we have pretty clearly, you know, in our, sort of in the way we sort of do sex online and in the drugs that we take and a lot of different ways we've taken sort of steps in a Huxleyan direction over the last 20, 30 years. I'd rather not take more steps in that direction. So you need some sort of sense of what it is you're resisting. You need an, a certain kind of anti-decadence um, within a decadent society, even if the plan isn't to sort of overthrow it and replace it with you know, Sharia law or Catholic integralism, you still need some sort of some sort of energy to push against the dystopian direction. Um, and, you know, there's also the question of of kids. Right. And and the future and this and this cuts in, in different ways. So my kids are are young. They're 10, 8, 5 and 1. And one thing I've noticed sort of looking at the range of of Catholic thinkers um, is that I feel like um, it, there's there's more enthusiasm for overthrowing decadence among people who are somewhat older and somewhat younger than I am, right? So if you haven't had kids or if you just had a kid, but you aren't sort of deep into the thick of parenting, you can imagine yourself <laughs> as having the energy to actually like change the world and transform it, right? And then I suspect that once your kids are grown and you sort of finished the work of parenting, you get a kind of, you know, a, a little renewed jolt of that energy. And also your kids are themselves adults and you still worry about their safety, but they seem a little bit less helpless than they than they do right now. But I, I do hmm. find with kids who are who are little that I you end up placing a higher premium on the stability of your society. So I'm less anti decadent in that way. Because I'm like, well, I don't want, you know, I, I don't want the, the revolution to come because I have to take care of an eight-year-old. I have to change a, you know, change a one-year-old's diaper, right? But you also have those kids as like hostages to the future. And you think more about, hmm. you know, what you were describing, right? The world in, in 50 years. Okay, I will be, you know, either have passed to my reward or be, you know, hanging on with some sort of life extension technology, to keep me alive, right? But my children will be my age or a tiny bit older, and presumably, God willing, they'll have children of their own. And that those extensions of myself, it will matter tremendously um, what's happening in society then. So, so it, it yeah, it, there's there's just pulls and there, there's pulls in multiple directions, right? Like like you don't. I want yeah. stability for the sake of my children at the moment, but I don't want sort of too much decadence because I want them to be able to have fulfilling lives in, you know, in 40 or 50 years. Right. Yeah. And so what, what role would you say national pride plays in either, um, in, in reviving a civilization or, um, being anti-decadent? Because I think one part of the bigger story, I mean, we've talked a bit about spirituality and religion and fertility rates, which is, I think, one dimension. One other resource that we have as Americans that most other advanced societies don't have is a particular con ideological conception of the state and America's mission, which generally has been something we could draw on to kind of fuel us a little bit. Like where, so in, in contrast, you know, whether it's Germany, Sweden, Denmark, those are countries that I think are more likely to be stuck in a perpetual decadence insofar as they have no animating mission. They no longer have religion almost at all. 
and they don't have a strong sense of uh, of universalist mission, let's say. I mean, obviously, there is the rise of ethno-nationalism, which is a little bit different. Um, and I was just actually uh, looking back at uh, not the Gallup poll that all of us talked about that came out about the decline of Christianity, which, Ross, you've written qu quite a bit about, but the one that came out last year where um, on National Pride, and I, whenever I look at this, I'm always reminded of how stark it is that um, only, I think it's only 23% of Democrats in 2020 said they were extremely proud to be American, where the number for Republicans was 67%. It's the largest partisan divide in the history of the Gallup poll when it comes to feelings of national pride. But when you have our meritocratic elite who dominate most cultural media and intellectual institutions in this country, if a majority of them can't summon sufficient pride in their own country, I think that is, is another part of this story. And that's not even really decadence. That might even be like a reversal of, that might even be something else. We need a different term for that because my understanding is that there's never been a successful, advanced, pro progressing society that has, you know, basically lost faith in its own sense of being in this regard, where elites just, you know, I don't want to say self-hatred, but a certain kind of ambivalence about what they themselves have helped create. So I'm, I'm curious, like, how much, how, how much does that specific part of it worry you? Because if we no longer, if we're losing religion, especially um, the, li you know, liberal elites in the, U in the U.S., but we're also losing our sense of national pride, it, it, there's a real vacuum there that, that goes beyond the question of decadence or, 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 um, or anti-decadence, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the ambivalence is decadent. I think if, if, you, if you lack pride in your country, but you have a complete vision of how it should be overhauled and transformed, then you're no longer decadent. <laughs> then, then, you're, then you're revolutionary, right? And so I think right. that, that, that question, again, I think sort of hangs over all these debates about wokeness and the new progressivism, right? To what extent is it just a new way of sort of restating elite, you know, elite anxiety and ambivalence? And to what extent is it a revolutionary program? Um, and of course, since I don't agree with the revolutionary program, I wouldn't be excited about its full implementation. Um, but at least it wouldn't be it wouldn't be decadent, whereas just to sort of to basically just sort of rule a society that you don't particularly like for a long time <laughs> does feel like sort of what what decadence looks like in practice. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is it is concerning. I mean, I, I think it, it is it exists for a reason, though, right? Like you you the challenge of American life in the early 21st century is precisely like the question of what kind of story does American society tell about itself? that makes sort of, you know, both political parties, but also sort of the, the you know, the multifarious diversity of the country feel a sense of unity and, and common purpose. And you don't want to overstate the importance of that, right? Like we're a country of 300 million people, and there's sort of probably a limit to what kind of common purpose you can, you can instill. Um, but but I do think there is a there is a failure of American narrative right now where the right has a narrative. It's the older narrative. It's a narrative that was sort of solidified, that was sort of established in the late 19th and early 20th century and solidified after World War Two and sort of incorporated part of the civil rights movement. Um, but maybe not, maybe not fully. Um, but it's it's a narrative that that isn't inclusive enough to sort of be sustaining in a, you know, more diverse society with legitimate claims being made on the American past by people, black Americans above all, maybe who were sort of deliberately excluded from from that older narrative. So the conservative narrative right now can't seem to stretch to be more than a like 40 or 50 percent of american narrative but then the liberal narrative is highly you know it's it's it doesn't it can't decide if where to find actual pride right in the history of the country 
And there is still a liberalism, which is the liberalism that I grew up with and was educated by that sort of culminated in the election of Barack Obama and then sort of fell apart under various pressures that has some kind of pride, right? This sense of sort of America as something that is a set of ideals that is constantly coming into being and being pursued and that we get closer and closer to without ever fully fulfilling, where you have this sort of link between the imperfect but but also heroic figures of the founding and the imperfect but more heroic figures of the Civil War era, you know, linking to Martin Luther King in 60s and 60s, the 60s civil rights era. That narrative is there, but it's weakened for various reasons. It's weakened because it's sort of failed as a practical matter to fulfill certain promises around racial equality, I think. It's weakened in part because of secularization, that the the narrative depends for its coherence on probably some kind of Protestant Christianity that liberals don't believe in anymore. And that, you know, like if you go back and read Lincoln and Martin Luther King, these guys are like doing theology, right? Um, mm. And there are echoes of that in Obama, but there really are not strong echoes of that anywhere in, in liberalism or left politics right now. And it, it's hard then to sort of run a thread back if you're cutting off the thickest part of the thread. Um, anyway, I'm just sort of rambling. But those no, those no, are no, those but... are sort of some ways of thinking about about the dilemma. Like what what is the story of America? I mean, this is why we're having these, you know, these arguments about critical race theory and textbooks in schools and so on. Right. There's a fundamental disagreement about how to tell the story of America. But the content is, is on the one hand, right, inflected and kind of secularized of the, the wokeness, right, of this, this moment right now, which I think we agree, as you said, uh, you know, at the beginning of, of this discussion, you, you mentioned, you know, whether, whether wokeness ends up uh, basically cashing out and just being, you know, uh, a part of the, the sort of landscape of, of, of uh, 21st century America and just like, you know, processed as, as something you check off in, in an HR department meeting or whether, whether it is in fact revolutionary. Um, it's, it's, it's at the same time, it's striking. It's John McHorder has, has, has pointed this out over and over again is, is how religious it is ultimately. Now it's interesting you say that, you know, you, you don't, you don't support the, 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 the tenets of, 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 uh, you know, the, call it the, the content of the woke revolution. And I agree with you. I, I'm, I'm troubled by a lot of the content of it. And I, I think they take a lot of the, as you said, the, the glue of America for granted. But what I keep jumping back to, and it is what, what John McCorder is talking about is, is, is how religious it is in so many ways, how, how fervent the belief is, how it's, it's less a philosophy and more a faith a lot of this stuff that's happening now, of course, it's it's larded over with this kind of uh, bizarre philosophy. So, I mean, I personally, uh, you know, if I try and take myself out of my own set of uh, concerns and worries and 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 beliefs and take try and take a step back uh, and take a look at America more broadly without necessarily myself in it, I can't help but feel that there, you know, to use the V word again, vitalism. There's a kind of vitality here. That's manifesting with this like great awakening, even though I'm I'm somewhat horrified by it. I mean, does that make sense, Ross? Is that does that resonate at all? Yeah, I mean, I I do think that the great awakening is more vital than um than almost anything, for instance, going on in Western Europe, and it has sort of its weird echoes in Western Europe in you know sort of incoherent British adoption. <laughs> of certain like tropes from the woke revolution and, you know, Emmanuel Macron's, you know, resistance to wokeness as, you know, as sort of his, his, his very French rallying cry. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, a, I, I think it is a expression of sort of deep forces in American history, Protestant spirituality in particular, sort of cycles of awakening and attempts at moral renewal um, that have always been part of the vitality of the United States and still exist in this strange, attenuated, half-secularized form. My main disagreement with McWhorter's analysis, of course, is that he thinks when he calls wokeness a religion, he's saying that's bad, right? right and right, right. that's not what I think. I, I think that right. the problem with wokeness is that it's relig it has some religious ideas that are misguided and also that its religious perspective doesn't 
it doesn't have a metaphysics that makes sense of its moralism. So it has mm. this incredible moral zeal, um, but it has sort of, you know, cut itself off from a conception of a religious conception of what the universe is and what human beings are and how we relate to God. And so you don't have th that's one of what I think are multiple sort of internal tensions and contradictions that I think prevent ultimately this kind of progressivism from becoming the all encompassing religious perspective that a lot of people who fear it the most see, right? You have a lot of people who do analysis of wokeness and they say, well, it's a lot like the Christian takeover of the Roman empire, right? <laughs> in the, yeah, in the, in yeah. the fourth century, you get people citing, um, you know, the, this book, the last pagan or the final pagan generation, right? About how the, the pagans couldn't cons really understand what was happening. And, and we, we, the unwoke are, are the pagans and in which case you know you can fit that in with decadence right and say well we have we have been like rome we have been decadent but this is how our decadence ends in a new cult taking over um and you know i'm biased being an actual christian of some sort but i just i don't think wokeness has the comprehensivity and you know sort of metaphysical plausibility of of of, of a sort of religion in full i so i don't think the full conversion can take i think it's sort of i think it's more of like a 10-year surge that then will give way to something else but the surge is yeah, well, but the surge well, is real well it's also not um a mass it's not a mass religion like unlike christianity and islam and the great religions of past it's essentially an elite vanguard movement that has built-in limitations on how many people it can convert i mean i'm always struck by the fact when i talk to normies <laughs> <laughs> they don't really seem to know what woke even means. And this is like an ongoing thing uh, on the podcast where right. I, I always bring up the fact that my mom never, I, she like every couple of months, she's like, Shadi, can you explain what woke means again? Like I always explain <laughs> it to her, but it's actually really hard. Maybe I'm also not good at explaining it, but it's, it's so, it sounds like when you try to actually outline what it's about, there's a sense of ridiculousness that I think is immediately apparent to normal people who aren't steeped in the lingo or in the basic ideas. And I think you made a point, Russ, in like one of your recent columns that, um, you know, uh, more and more demo uh, progressives are woke, but we still vote for people like Joe Biden, who's not woke. And that allows us to have it both ways that there is still this rising elite that has these odd ideas but then for the broader population they see a figurehead like joe biden who is just normal like them and isn't particularly controversial or distinctive and that reassures them and so i think for a lot of people like my mom who are democrats but aren't really politicized or engaging with elite institutions Wokeism is is for at least as far as I can tell, it's unlikely it's unlikely that it will become part of their lives in a way that when Christianity was rising or when Islam was rising, you couldn't avoid it. Everyone had to contend with that reality and make a decision about whether they wanted to convert or not convert. Yeah, I mean, I think the place where you could where you could have the the encounter with normies, right, is primarily in schools, and that's why. And that is precisely why these debates have moved so quickly to, you know, should critical race theory, whatever that may be, be taught in public schools and should state governments legislate against it and so on. Um, because to the extent that there is a national institution where these ideas could be encoded and propagated, it would be elementary and junior high and, and high school. Right. So that that's but in a society with low fertility an aging society with low fertility, fewer people encounter that institution as a sort of primary or universal institution. So even there, you could say that, like, even if these debates do become sort of central to arguments about education for the next 10 years, lots and lots of people can still sort of, you know, tune them out. And there's also but then there's also sort of the question. Right. So like. To what extent does does something like popular culture get remade by these ideas? So right now, you know, if you if I go if I go into, you know, Disney Plus 
um and look at old disney movies you'll you'll you know you'll turn one on you'll turn on peter pan which has you know some egregious stereotypes of native americans shall we say right and you'll get a content warning um or even like i think the swiss family robinson one of my kids favorite movies for a while has a content warning because it has you know sinister southeast asian pirates right who who attack the <laughs> extremely nordic um or nor you know i guess they're swiss so you know the the extremely european the extremely <laughs> white family at the center of the story so you have these content warnings right so like that seems like a really sustainable equilibrium where basically the you know the elites feel compelled by sort of the new quasi religion to you know sort of put these warnings on have these trigger warnings and so on around problematic works of pop culture but you don't get like a purge right i mean you know you you get sort of occasional things a book disappears from amazon you know disney pulls a movie like it pulled song of the south a long time ago from its archives that happens but the the vast bulk of sort of pre-woke culture still exists it's accessible it's part of the american imagination it doesn't go away and when this sort of tide recedes you know you start making raunchy comedies in hollywood again and nobody bats an eye that that seems like a very plausible scenario and it's just different from a scenario where you know the commissars actually take over and disney is like no all our movies made before 1970 are no longer available because they like like because Cinderella ratifies patriarchal norms or something, right? Like that's the actual revolution, which I don't think we're going to get. But that's that's what that's what the full the fuller revolution would look like. And again, you would then normies would be affected. Normies would not be able to watch, you know, gross out comedies from the early Judd Apatow era because they have homophobic <laughs> jokes. That's it for part one. If you enjoyed that, we have another 30 minutes of our conversation with Ross as a bonus episode for paying members only. Once again, if you haven't subscribed, please consider doing so. Go to wisdomofcrowds.live slash subscribe and get access not only to the bonus episode material, but also to our regular Friday essay feature, which Shadi and I take turns writing every week. Thanks for listening again, and we hope you'll join us.